afterwards if you want as well. Okay, thanks. Great. Over to Dave. Uh, hmm. uh, hi, hi, folks. I'm Dave from uh, SCDC. Uh, we help and facilitate the session today. And Sam? Um, Hello, my name is Sam. I'm the uh, communications manager at SCDC. I'm working behind the scenes on the Zoom, but also on the kind of design and layout of the of the guide itself. Okay. Okay. So, um, thank you, guys, for that. Um, when we go into our workshops, you'll all be able to introduce yourselves when when you're in there, so um, you can find out who's who's in the room with you. So there'll be a wee bit of time for that. Um, let's go straight to. Um, uh, the, what's actually in the existing tool at the minute? So let me let me just see. You can never find your windows, the one that you want when you want it. Hold on. No, I don't see it. Hold on. Uh, got it, but. Oh, there it is. Sorry about that. Um, can you all see the the um, the slide that I'm looking at at the minute? Yeah. Um, the proposed how-to guide section. So within the within the the actual um, the the guide and based on the information that we got um, from you, we 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 started to look at uh, in a bit more detail about the, the what the guide should look like. So there are five sections um, within the, the guide itself. Um, uh, first of all, is why prepare a local place plan. Uh, the second one is getting ready um, to prepare that that local place plan, developing your your place plan what your place plan should look like and delivering your place plans. So um, five pretty broad headings, but we've got quite a lot of detail um, underneath it, those headings. And at this stage, it would be useful if you guys could maybe have a wee look at the, the actual, um, the, 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 the detail itself. So what we'll do is we'll give you seven minutes to have a look through um, the the information that you've been sent, um, let us know if you can, if you don't have access to to that, uh, and we'll we'll run the slides um, on on screen. As not, not in fact, we've got something on screen. So um, if you could um, access the, the information that you've been sent, does that seem okay? Can, can is there any of you who who don't have access to to that that previous email that was sent out to you with the PDF? that information and then we'll come back into the room. Thank you. 
Hello, everybody. So you've, you've had your homework. <laughs> um, well done. Um, th thanks for taking the time to, to look through um, the draft uh, guidance that, that, that we sent out. Um, for the next stage, then we'd hope to have a bit more detailed um, discussion um, about what's there. Um, so what we're going to do is, we're, without any delay, we're going to go into um, breakout rooms. And within there, we've got um, around about um, 45 to 50 minutes where we can have a discussion about what's there. There's going to be a facilitator um, in the room with you. Um, and we're also going to record in the breakout rooms as well. So that's where we'll get some of our useful uh, information. And again, this is really just for us to use um, when we're writing up the next, uh, the, the next phase of the actual guidance itself. OK, so um, Sam, um, if you could um, put us into to the rooms, that would be great. Uh, I just wanted to say to Suzanne, the coming back into the break, out of the breakout room can be quite cruel in conversations, Kata, but you, we got you at the very last word in your sentence. <laughs> Thank you. Is everyone back in? Are we all here. I think we're all back, aren't we? Yeah, yeah. that's it. 18, yeah. Great. Okay, well, look, thank you all very much for coming back. Sorry, yes, it was cool in our group as well. David got chopped off. I think you're just about finished, David. Um, but we didn't get on to the next subject of um, uh, how to deliver local place plans, which was our third topic. Uh, so hopefully another group got into that. But we have, we have a few minutes now. We have 20 minutes. Uh, we need to leave five at the end for wrap-up. So we have an opportunity now, really, if there's... If it, there's no need to repeat anything you've already said, but if there's anything else that you have in mind from reading through the document earlier on through that draft table of contents, anything else that you think, oh, I must say that before we finish, it's really important. Or indeed, if you've got any other points or questions, which might not be about the guide, they could be linked to, to just to local place plans more generally. Um, it could be messages you wanted to take back to the government about about the whole concept. So there's a couple of there's a couple of things. They wish they had had chance to say. Um, if anyone has something, could you just stick your hand up quickly, and then I can get an idea of of how many folk there are. You won't got anything. I can't believe you all said everything you wanted to say. <laughs> so John, John Beaton's got something, uh, and so has Colin. Well, look, let's take John and Colin first of all, and then the rest of you, if anything springs to mind, just stick your hand up after Colin and we'll come to it. So I suppose, you know, since, since the floor's open, I can get yeah, um, for the government, um, my one is about, so really the National Planning Framework aligned the Planning Act Scotland 2019 with the Community Impairment Act of 2015. That was, for me, it seemed to be the statutory purpose. Um, and that means that the Planning Act Scotland would take the local development plans, take into account the local outcome improvement plan. Right. This is a technical bit. In terms of systemic discrimination, whether it be intentional or unintentional, the local outcome implementation plans that were were, were, were done didn't, in general, take in the needs of disabled people. So to avoid duplication, 
um, the local development plans, a vision statement has been repealed to avoid unnecessary duplication of multivisions for an area. And the expectation is that local development plans will contribute a wider vision as set out in the local outcome implementation plan. But if we are contributing to a vision that didn't include us in the first place and it's nothing without us, nothing about us without us, then systemically in terms of the narrative of the legislation and its timing, we're further distancing ourselves from providing accessible communities. So that's my one for the government. Um, my one, because possibly because I missed the first meeting for, as, as a wider reflection is, can we write this plan on the basis of inclusive design principles um, and use those sort of priorities to shape it? Um, and also, have we written a, a clear set of or two or three outcomes that we're looking to get out of this guide and then what those outputs would be and then what we'd be measuring on the other side so we can measure the impact of the guide so it too can be a living doctor document and that totally changed in time because obviously we're going to be going to a stage of flux where more and more documents are going to need to be revised on a, on a basis. And um, the third one was um, I would have thought Disability Equality Scotland would have been a key stakeholder um, in this process, um, given that they're the umbrella organisation for the 30 or so disability access panels in Scotland, which um, as non-statutory consultees review uh, planning applications. So um, surprised not to see Marvin Brooks or our staff here, or I'm not sure that I just think they would bring an awful lot of value to this. Probably a great more deep value than I can. Well, that's not true. That's very helpful. Um, so something around clarity and um, what you were saying, first of all, John. Um, so clarity the purpose of the guide, you know, yeah, yes. being like, what is the actual outcomes that we're seeking from this, even one or two outcomes or simply one outcome? Because, mm. um, you know, that that helps me sort of contextualise my role and being able to focus on, on what mm. area. They say the easiest way to, to do this is if inclusive design principles were designed by the arch came from the architectural movement in terms of making it an inclusive document is why not use the principles of inclusive design to design the document um, and that would hopefully create a sort of virtuous cycle. Mm. Okay great thanks. Okay um, and so everyone else knows John was making the point as well during our group that um, the whole point of inclusive design and disability and all these other things, they, they should not be bolt-ons, they should run through the whole document all the way through. Um, so we've got that point as well. Um, Colin, I think you wanted to say something as well. Yeah, it was really, I think it was sort of set off in my mind, but it was having a, I, I looked through the, fairly quick look through the um, notes from the previous meeting just earlier on, which I thought were really informative, very helpful. But there was a bit that very much struck me where there was one comment which said something like, um, from a community point of view, don't, don't send in somebody to tell us what to do. Um, give us a chance to work through things um, at our own pace to some extent, and, and, and then we'll get to how we're, how we're, gonna, how we're gonna handle this. And, and, and then the next comment was something about, um, communities need support and in particular you know if this is going to work and in particular the communities that are currently worst off or are, that are worst off and that this process is most important for need support or not much is going to happen mm -hmm. and you sort of put those there's a kind of conundrum in there about how you how you resolve that now I think that's something to do with what sort of support people get and I don't really mean so much the kind of the more technical end of support I mean, I suppose to use to use the shorthand community development support. So I, I, I think the document could probably do with exploring more about how where communities look for that, how they should decide what they want, and and, and a bit round that. But well, that's great because that emphasises something that Judy was saying in our group around those very things, and also makes me think of what um, John from Campbell Slang, John, what you said at the last working group, uh, sorry, the last workshop we had, uh, and you made the point that it's all very well, that, that it, 
if local place plans are to be effective as community-led plans and fraction and whatever, then yes, local authorities may need some support in facilitating them, but critically, communities need direct support themselves to be able to do stuff. And that, that's very clear in my mind. It links to what, I think what Colin was just saying there. Um, mm -hmm. this, this whole thing of targeted support and uh, uh, targeting local place plans at places of need and then making sure that the support is there for communities as well as local authorities seems to be fundamental. Mm. Yeah, I, I, I think three issues that came out of our working group or three principles were sort of mm -hmm. legitimacy, capacity and deliverability. And um, the, ca the capacity issues is, is important. Um, and something I didn't have time to, mm -hmm. to say, but I, I was reflecting on things that, um, that others were saying in the group was the issue of, of, um, of legitimacy. And that's legitimacy within the community um, because communities are complex sets of interests of, and it's partly geographic in terms of, 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 of neighborhoods, it's partly history um, in terms of, you know, those who go back generations, those who've, who've moved in um, over time. Um, it's uh, related to sort of socio-income um, groupings and, and a whole series of other, other, other combinations of interest. And um, uh, there's the question of how you, how you ensure that whoever from within the community is leading um, or has a leadership role that that is seen as 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 legitimate um, by virtue of the way in which leadership has been established and the way in which it conducts itself. Um, the, the, you know the um, something that was always in our minds in the example I cited was you know somebody saying who are you to, to say we need this or that or the other. Um, as even though we are a, an elected community group in its question of, of establishing that legitimacy. Um, the other is legitimacy relative to other democratic structures, um, governance structures. And um, again, uh, I felt that, you know, for some several years, we were almost like whistling in the wind, although we were doing sort of ed evidence gathering and so on. It was only when we had a breakthrough by working with elected members and the executive team of of the local authority that they recognized, okay, that there was a need for a process to start. Um, and it was, the, it was by virtue of that, uh, those local authority structures, if you like conferring top-down legitimacy on the process that we were undertaking, that was, that, that was really important. It, you know, we might've felt that that was unfair in the way that that uh, developed, but nevertheless, that was the experience, um, if that's making sense, so, mm. you know. Um, mm -hmm. you know. So, that, that, you know, we, we talked about capacity, we talked about deliverability, but um, whether, how, if, whether we call it legitimacy or, or, or something else, I think spending some time in the document about establishing what the community interest is and its inclusivity would be really important, again, maybe with some worked examples. Thank you very much. Yeah. Any other thoughts which spring on from that? But could I say mm. um, that I we've been really frustrated um, with this because we felt that our voice hasn't been heard, and so it's it's important that if people are prepared to spend time on the local place plans, that they know that what they come up with will be heard. And I've been discussing this guide with, with others. And again and again, it's, well, I'm not sure about this because they, you know, what will happen? What are the outcomes? How are they going to, to, to actually take them on board? And so how it gets its legitimacy as a document and as a process. Um, and again, if people are going to spend time on this, which they need, then they need to be assured that there will be a good outcome. And that's making me think, Judy, of, of discussions, in fact, which Susan and I had a few days ago. Um, it, a, a few chats I've had in the last couple of weeks uh, around people who've been involved in community action plans in the last few years. And it's almost as if there are, there are two ways that that legitimacy with, with government organisations might work. One is that 
government organizations are told through government guidance um, or secondary legislation, which we don't have yet, but that they're told they must take account of local place plans, whether that's around land use planning or it's around public service delivery or whatever. So th th there's the instruction. And then the other is the one that kind of Susan described uh, to us a week or two ago, which is just of local authority officers, or when Susan in this case, um, officers from the National Park, just being involved and listening and thinking, how can I use what I'm hearing from the community? How can I use that to inform, in this case, planning policy? So the more informal. It feels like there's kind of two potential ways. Um, Susan, I don't know if you know, it, it, is there anything that's, that's worth sharing from your point of view about that, about your experience yeah. maybe? Um, well, yeah, I mean, obviously our experience is working with quite small rural communities, um, but definitely my perspective is, for me as a planner, the process is, is just as valuable to me as the actual plan and the outcomes of the plan. It means that I can get to know the community that I serve, that I'm paid to work for and represent and prepare a local development plan in the best interests of that community. And it, it makes my job so much easier and I can form a working relationship with the community. Um, it's a challenge as a planner, um, often sometimes perceived negatively by communities. I'm not going in to tell them what to do. It's for me to be in receive mode and to understand their aspirations for the place um, going forward. But also I think there's a role for me and, and others in terms of communities preparing these plans now in the context of everything we were talking about in our group around climate change. And we're, we're in a new phase now. We're not returning to life before COVID. We've now got a new opportunity to, to we need to change. And I think place plans will need to be thinking in this wider aspirational context as we were last year when we started looking at this. Mm. Sorry, I've kind of flung something else in there, Nick. <laughs> I'll just Hello. mute myself. Any thoughts on what Susan just said? Oh, I see Anthony, you've got your hand up. Yeah. I can just see it. Uh, yeah, there's a, a few things that touch on what John said and touch on with Susan, as and Susan probably knows what I'm going to say because we've talked about this in depth um, when we were going through it. For me, planning, is for the benefit of the community, always has been, always will be. And what Susan says I chime with, um, and what we did in Western Barnshire, Nick, you'll know this, is we went pretty much further than that about one of the questions we were asked, and I said this in the group is, what's the point of us doing a plan? What's the point of us doing our own neighbourhood plan? What's the point of us doing our own local place plans? First thing community will ask you. And we said, well, this is the process that we have got. It's up to you how you wish to abide by this process. But if you do it, your neighbourhood plan will become a part of a locality plan, which will become part of a development plan. Therefore, you have your plan is pretty much the same status as a development plan. Therefore, everybody has to listen to you. And that's the way Western Barnshire have taken the point about basing everything we do around place. And that's how I see that, you know, communities having a bit of power. And that's gone a bit further than most authorities would do it. But we've got a clear structure in place and a clear policy framework that we can show communities that it's worth your time and effort doing one of these. No matter how you want to do it, no matter how big you want to do it, we'll always support you as well. And I'm paid, to, as, as, as Susan says, to get to know our communities, get to know what they need and what their things. And when you do it at a grassroots, supporting them through them developing their plan, you find out an awful lot about what you want. And we did this in the deprived area. Secondly, the thing about legitimacy and leadership in constituted groups and how this chimes with the community, um, and this is one that you might want to take back to the government as well, is I've seen a draft of the secondary legislation and it doesn't require community consultation on these plans. That's a big thing for local place plans to do. They have to be backed by a community, whether that's two streets and the state or a whole community, anything that should, a community prepares should be put out for full community consultation because only the, by getting that will you have the legitimacy for that plan to go to others and funders. So it's a big, um, I don't know why they've gone down that route, but I still think if it's in secondary legislation, it's not, the guide should look at communities, you know, consulting with their community about what should be in the plan. Therefore you avoid 
the, the issues of somebody getting their own way on it as well. Um, and thirdly, the guide should look at groups that maybe not that are not constituted and how they become constituted, Nick, and how they can function, because not every area of a community council, not every area have like a trust, you know, a development trust. They might be just a group of individuals that are like sort of tenants and residents association that come together and want to do their own plan. Um, and that's one of the pilots that we are doing is we are having to do facilitated sessions and how groups become constituted because there's nothing there to tell them what they can be and how to go about it. So maybe the guide needs to look at that to form that other level of legitimacy um, as well. You know all the issues I'm talking about anyway, so I'll, I'll, I'll shut there. But that's just my talking's work from my experience of being a planner and being a community planner as well. That's very really helpful. Just coming in Susan's point, and um, Suzanne, oh sorry, sorry, go on, sorry, John. Just, just and, a quick one on Susan's one, um, and I, I'm, I'm drawn back to it in my own model for change that was written um, for this project by disabled people, and they, they established the theory of change first, and then started coming up with their needs. One thing I'd like to say, with Susan, is that one of the things that was really important that came out of it was the social cohesion and the social capital was built out of that relationship building and also leading them into different avenues of working with different statutory instruments, whether it be community planning, whether it be participatory budgeting, or maybe their needs were better placed for other areas. Um, I've just constituted a DPO, aren't they? And the amount of work that goes in uh, doing the constitution, let alone the incorporation for a disabled persons organisation to happen, um, it was working with that diffuse community that hadn't had a DPO for 22 years was a four year piece of development work um, for that to happen. So if you don't have a local access panel in your area, but I'd like to compliment um, the National Park Authority there because inclusive Cairn Gorms, they actually have an inclusive forum where people can influence the parks work and how they plan their, their activities and the, the natural environment and built environment around it. And they're an exemplar in, in leading on that. Um, but yeah, I just think that there's a big gap here again, where you've got government carving out an opportunity for citizens to populate and have a more participatory democracy, but we're going to end up using representative structures that already exist to enact that legislation. And without community development workers, boots on the ground, I'm sorry, I, I really don't see this making much difference in my community of interest, apart from uh, further excluding us from, from these opportunities. Um, and I know that sounds really negative, but it's based on four years rock face learning. We got that message from early on as well. Thanks, John. Yes. We'll feed that, but that's not the message for us to put in the guide for communities. But no, no, for sure. It's just to feed back to the More, more sort of government. Collins remarks. Yes. Somehow we need to be sort of signposting people to areas of support yes. where they can learn those skills. Um, and leadership, again, representation, talking about going to representative groups. Uh, this isn't about representative leadership, this is about facilitative leadership, and those are two completely different things. Um, I think Suzanne was wanting to come in. Yeah, thanks. Um, it was just to pick up and probably extend further some of the points that have already been made, um, just based on our experience in East Ayrshire. Um, absolutely needs to be, I would agree, about that community development support um, not to do things for, but very much support, guide and uh, facilitate the development of these plans. And that's certainly been the critical role that we've seen over the last number of years. We have been embedded the community action plan model in East Ayrshire. And now, um, in addition to that, I was, I was mentioning in our own group about the development of the placemaking maps alongside that that have been adopted um, locally and then subsequently by Scottish Government that then obviously form part of the formal planning process. Um, for, so our communities' plans are absolutely key to anything that any of our local authority services are looking to do um, within communities. They need to go in through the door of the community action plans. But I suppose my point to the government, and this has been talked about at the very start of this, uh, an event that that you were involved in, Nick, was about, and it's in the notes from our last session, is about the relationship with the existing community-led action plans, because we have a proven track record of 21 communities who have a community-led action plan, So what, and then we're obviously on the back of that developing and integrating the support with the communities around placemaking maps, so what difference are the local place plans, and what benefits and added value are they for our communities, and that was something we talked about in our group. 
Um, and the, my final point is just about that legitimacy of the clans and about um, that whole consultation within your community. And I think it was Anthony mentioned it as well, that anything that a community does needs to be consulted on and engaged right across the communities. And that's what we've seen again, a proven track record with our community-led action plans, that before those plans even go forward for um, comment or engagement, it's a 40% return rate from the community. And what we then say once, and a lot of our communities have had more over and above that in terms of their community surveys that they've done. But what we've then been able to, to say and, and say to our communities is you have the, the mandate on behalf of your community to take these plans forward. And it isn't your usual suspects because there is tensions between groups. We know that from a, from a community development perspective. These plans have actually attracted new people um, to get involved in their communities that just have a particular interest whether it be environmental, heritage or whatever, that come together with other people. Yeah, they maybe go on at the end um, once they've launched their plan and start implementing to develop into a trust or, or a regeneration group or an action group, but they've actually never maybe been part of an existing group. And that's new skills and talents coming forward in a community, which is absolutely critical because sometimes the existing leaders in our communities are not the, although they might be the loudest voice, they're absolutely not always the best people to be driving forward these plans so I think that needs to be in the guidance in some way that it's very much about the engagement and involvement of absolutely anybody in your community but it needs to be led by the community for the community or, or it is a complete waste of time for our communities I would say and I'm talking from a local authority perspective but absolutely that's where they get the buy-in from and our local authorities needs to be listening and, and taking cognizance of these plans um, as we've been doing for a number of years now. Well, look, that's, that's really helpful. And it's kind of squared the circle in effect because in the group I was in, we were talking very much about all these legitimacy issues and how, how a community group gets going. Um, and we've ended up hearing, in this case, from three or four local authorities and national parks who, who are trying to respond and to support that. So I think there's something around spreading the way that you're doing it around to all 32 or 34 authorities in order to support uh, a properly, uh, properly community-led approach. Um, yeah, well, look, it's, it's just gone three o'clock and we said three o'clock. So unless there's any burning things anybody else wants to say, um, and do put your hand up if there are as, as we do a final wrap up, what we'll do is we'll send a note round of the meeting like we did last time. And if there's anything else that springs to mind, please do let us know in response, either by email or phone or whatever. Um, there's been some incredibly useful input uh, really around honing the messages, I think, that are in, the, that, are in that draft table of contents um, and kind of focusing us, just from what I've heard anyway, and there's the other two groups as well. We will now get going on producing a draft guide itself, which... Um, we were already thinking before today would have lots of examples in to try and bring things to life, which is something that John said in our group, for example. So we'll come back to you probably at the end of January, I think, to give us as much time as we can to get that draft together. Um, and then we'd like to ask you, really, do you think it's hitting the spot in terms of everything that you said today? So we'll come back to you then for the draft. We thought we'd hold another workshop at that point, if that's... if if. If people can't make the workshop, don't worry, we'll send you a draft out anyway, and you can come in that way. But we thought we'd hold another workshop at that point, same format, if that's okay. So we'll invite you to that once we get a date sorted out. Um, Dave, sorry, Dave has had to disappear because his heating's bust and his gas man has arrived. So <laughs> that seems like a good excuse to me. Um, Paul, is there anything else that we should add before we finish up? No, uh, just to say that um, some of our conversations have been absolutely fantastic and real and led us in really useful directions. Uh, anything, just other than just to reiterate what um, Nick had just said there, that um, anything that you haven't had an opportunity to say, please put it in an email and, and, and send it to us. Any thoughts that you have following this has been really useful. I, I, I can just say that in the workshop that I was in, it, there's been some really good new stuff that's come up and, and is, will actually lead us in, uh, you know, and, and and actually, I'm you know taking it in a slightly different direction. So really, really useful stuff. Um, and and just thanks, thanks everybody for your time. So thank you all very much. And we'll, 
have a good Christmas. Well, first time I said it this year. Um, and we'll see you in January. <laughs> so thanks yeah. a lot. Thank you, everybody. Good Bye. Bye. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you, everybody. Bye.